Mr. Turner today. Um, and he is going to join the call, but he was in transit, so he was getting back to his office so he could dial in. So we are going to get the presentation on police procedures today. It's just going to be a little bit out of order. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and skip to item number three, which is discussion on the RFQ process and next steps. And so I wanted to kind of get you guys back together again so we can discuss that process. I will let you know that Rich Sessi with our procurement division is on the line. So if you guys have specific questions about this process, he's going to be the best person to ask. So that's why I've asked him to join the call so he could give us or give you guys that information if you do have questions that are RFQ related. Um, so with that being said, I did send you the Word document that was sent to me from Rich. Hopefully you had an opportunity to kind of look over that. that to me seems a little bit more than what you guys are necessarily going to need based off of my discussions with Rich. But essentially what we're looking for in today's meeting is for you guys to come to an agreement of who's going to represent this group. I think that'll be a, a good process instead of trying to reconvene this group every single time. If we can pick a few representatives to give the study session presentation on the 10th and to be the individuals who not only create that RFQ, but also do the interviews once the um, responses come back in, it would be those same sets of individuals. So I'd like you guys to have a little bit of discussion on that today and then make a motion to decide who's going to represent you as a group in those, those upcoming steps. So whoever wants to go ahead and start that discussion, go ahead. <laughs> okay, since I'm not scared to say anything anytime, uh, I would uh, definitely like, I know a lot of people work, a lot of people are doing things, but if it's possible, I definitely would want uh, Meredith uh, because I, I like how she hears many voices and she retains the different aspects of what people say. And uh, so I would like to include her on that as being a representative. I second for Meredith. Um, Due to those same, those same regards, um, and since I presented already in the um, in the last in February, um, I do not want to present in the study session. I feel that would be good for someone else to speak up. I have no problem with helping with the RFQ development um, and also the picking of it. But if we would prefer someone who doesn't work for the city to be a part of that process, just to avoid any any conflict, and I would prefer that. Okay, so right now we do have a motion on the floor to select Meredith as being one of the representatives, if she's willing to do that, which I think from our previous meeting, she said she would be willing to take on that role. If no one has any objections, then we'll have Meredith be the first person to fill one of those slots. Okay, Meredith, you are person number one. Um, so I think the best option for this group is either to pick three people or two people. Um, so who would be the second person? Are there any recommendations for a second person to represent this group in the next upcoming steps? I'll jump in there and volunteer myself. I'll second that. I was gonna I was gonna nominate you. Okay, I rescind my nomination so that Casey can give me Am I slow? <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that nomination. All right. So if there's no objections to Thad being the second person to represent this group, then we will include Thad on that as well. Um, and Meredith has asked what time the study session is on the 10th. That is at 10 o'clock, at 10 o'clock. It is not at 10 o'clock, that's a lie. It's at six o'clock on the 10th. So it'll start at six. You guys will probably be either the first or second presentation. Um, so you'd wanna be there at six. And Becky, okay. just to clarify for Thad and I, so we're prepared. Uh, I know our next steps will include um, reviewing the RFQ, and I think you had pointed to the operation letter less as a good example, and I, I think it's pretty straightforward, and we can pull directly from the um, Word document we shared as kind of a, a baseline for that. 
um, do we ex do you expect us to present um, our recommendation and actually walk through the RFQ in anticipation of the meeting where the council will actually take action and vote? What would you like to see happen at the work session? So at the study session, I think really what the expectation is, is that you don't necessarily have to have the RFQ written out. And I have a few additional things to add to that as well. You don't necessarily have to have that written out by the 10th. It's more of this is what we're looking for as a committee. This is why we're looking for it. Maybe give them, because again, Rome made a good point at our last meeting. We do have some new council members that weren't able to um, be, be there whenever you guys had your first presentation in February. So maybe give them a quick overview of what you guys have been working on up, and up to this point, and then why you guys are asking for the city to consider going through the RFQ process. See if they have any feedback on that. Um, and then kind of go and kind of go from there. But your presentation piece, I think, is you know an update of what you guys have been doing and why you guys are wanting to go through the RFQ process for this next step. Um, so with that being said, like I said, I did have some additional some additional feedback from the staff perspective on the RFQ process. So, I'm um, sorry. You said about well, because can I nominate someone else? Since you said there are about three people. Yeah, if you guys want to have a third person, I think that's completely acceptable. Who would you like to nominate, Thad? Well, and it obviously is if they're available. I would like to see Helen Hurley, if she's available to get in here on this, because I really appreciate her perspective in her area of expertise and what she does. I would be available, Thad. Yay. Do we have a second on that? I'll second it. I'll second, I second that. It. All right. Um, if there's no objections, then Helen will be the third person to represent the group. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Thad. Okay. So um, with the RFQ process, I received some information regarding, um, let me see here, some public engagement. So basically, it's, it's citizen engagement regarding what that RFQ should also look like. And that's one of the steps that staff has recommended that we potentially incorporate into this process. So as we are drafting the RFQ, there should be some, some citizen engagement in that to see what they think would also be a good, you know, good qualities to have in the RFQ process for who is essentially not only representing this committee in the dialogue as the moderator, but the community as a whole. So part of staff's recommendation for this process is that you do get that community engagement while you're drafting the requirements of the RFQ. And with that being said, uh, some of the community engagement, um, which will include some of these members, because, you know, since these are the people willing to come to the table in the first place, uh, mm -hmm. I think the concerned citizens uh, Casey's part of that, I'm a part of that, and Mr. and Mrs. Harris, and possibly one or two other members. So that would give you six people community engagement, uh, you know, uh, because that would be good representation on this RFQ. I think those voices need to be part of it. So I think with the, the subcommittee, if you will, that you've created out of Meredith, Thad, and Helen, I think that's something that you three would probably want to go ahead and discuss amongst yourselves on what that community engagement looks like. Again, you're representing this committee as a whole on that process. And I think that's part of your, that's part of this subcommittee's process to kind of massage that out for lack of better terms and figure out how you get that community engagement. Um, and so as I was speaking with staff, I kind of came up with a very rough timeline. So if you need more time and you want more time, that's acceptable. These, these deadlines aren't set in stone by any means. So obviously on August the 10th, we have the study session. That is a set in stone date. Um, that's the only study session that we have prior to our council going into their strategic planning session on the 10th, or excuse me, on the 20th. So that study session will have to happen. But again, that is really more informational than anything. So you don't have to have, you know, everything laid out there on the 10th. Um, the next benchmark date that I have is, let's see here, the 31st of August. Um, and what I have here would be 
that initial draft that you as the, the subcommittee would be creating for that RFQ. Once you have that draft completed, then you would go into your public engagement piece um, to get feedback from the public for the RFQ that you drafted. Giving, obviously we have to have something to kind of engage the public on, so you will have to have a little bit of a rough draft there to get out to them. Becky, um, before you go on to the next milestone, what's the format for that? Is that, um, is that a survey form? Is that a listening session? Is that, and how long does that have to be open for community engagement for a period of time? Is that a couple of days or a week? I think that's something that the subcommittee probably can can determine how you want to engage. I would say with current state of events, I mean, if you wanted to hold maybe virtual meetings, that would be fine. I think you'd probably benefit from maybe just sending out like a survey, just an email survey. I don't think it has to be anything too, too large to where it takes, you know, four or five months to complete. I don't think that's the purpose of it. It is just to get a general idea of what, you know, the community is, is looking for in this RFQ. So as far as the public engagement piece on it, what I have right now is two weeks just to get kind of, just to see what's out there kind of thing. But if you feel like you need more time than the two weeks, I think that's appropriate. And then I, but I would ask for that subcommittee to come back to us and let us know how much time you feel like you would need for that public engagement piece. And then we can't use staff time and resources, but do you think we would be able to tap into Meg's office to push that survey out if that's what we decided to do, or we just need to use our own grassroots, try to share the survey however we can? I mean, I feel like I, I think we could probably work with Meg on that a little bit to maybe push it out to social media and see what our options are there. I'm not going to volunteer her office for anything, obviously, but I'm more than happy to have that conversation with her to see if that's something she could help us with in getting it out to more people, because I think that's the point, as many people as we can, you know, touch in that sense. Um, so... So yeah, so again, I, the time frame that I put on that was between 8.31, which was the day that you guys would ultimately be finished drafting it, to 9.11, which would essentially be about two weeks. Um, but again, if you need more time in that public engagement piece or you feel like more time would be needed, then I think that is acceptable to extend out. Um, the 9-11 date actually works a little bit because then on 9-14, we have another study session. And I think that would be a good opportunity for you guys to present to the council what you have determined to be part of the RFQ. And you can present that to the council and get any feedback that you would need from them before we actually issue out the RFQ. And then with my my rough timeline, nine the week of nine fourteen is when city staff would issue out that RFQ, and we would start that process. And one other uh, details question: um, the council does not need to take action to actually approve the posting of an RFQ. No. Okay. No, this is that is really just informational to kind of keep them in the loop and to get that additional council buy-in for that RFQ process. So if they have any, if they have any comments, questions, or concerns about that, then you guys will, you'll, you'll know at the study sessions, like if they have any, any feedback, positive or negative to what you're recommending. And that is all I have as far as the timeline. Did you guys have any additional questions on that? Did you have any questions regarding the process for Rich since he has generously joined the call for us? So just for me, for clarification, what are we asking citizens specifically about? Is it about the RFQ or what they want, what area or do, like, is it what the goal of the RFQ is? It would be the it would be the RFQ. So essentially, you guys will draft what you think needs to be in the RFQ. So those those line items of things that you feel like a good moderator would need. And Rich, please correct me if I'm wrong on on what that list looks like. And then we would then essentially send it out for public engagement to see if they agree that those are the important things that need to be included in that RFQ, or if they feel like we need to include more things to get the right person to be the moderator for the next steps. Okay. Yeah, Becky, I think you 
summarize it pretty well as far as what the purpose is because when you're doing this process what you're trying to do is you're trying to come up with a broad scope of things that you're looking for for whoever these people are that you know person or persons that will be doing this moderation facilitation process what what are these qualities and so from listening from the conversation i think you guys have a good approach more feedback the better because you know you want to have people in place eventually that everybody thinks are fair-minded and has the best you know thought process to make this whole you know the end goal happen you know you want somebody in a facilitating role that you know has awareness of all the different needs of the community what the background of the community is and and I think you guys are off to, you know, a good thought process by trying to get as much engagement as possible prior to putting something out there. Can I ask a question then? So for this RFQ, um, when we send things out uh, on this email, I'm thinking it is a possibility to have two, you know, I'm just getting down specific so I'll know when I send things out to people. It is the possibility of having two. Uh, does finance matter when, with an RFQ? And then also, um, should we cut it off? You know, just five candidates or whatever. Or do I would like to know specifics on those things. Well, when it comes to a qualifications um, solicitation, you're not asking for money. What you're trying to merely find out is based upon the needs of the role or the job that you're trying to get filled, you collectively as a group with citizen and council feedback, you're looking for the qualities and price is not a factor at this stage. Okay, price is not a factor, just making sure. I was throwing it out there because when we talked previously, price was a factor a little bit and so, you know, I'm just wondering, they have a hard job, so I just want them to take in consideration because our funds were said to be smaller than we would hope. So let's uh, remember that price is a factor a little bit because all people are different. And so, and we did talk about that. That's the only reason I mentioned it. And, and I think like that because we do have a smaller budget than we admit. Yeah, I, I get it. But yeah, I mean, you know, you gotta, first of all, find out who, who's the best fit. And then, you know, once you have a pool of people, then later after you get that pool of people, then you can start talking price. But, you know, we're at the, the first phase of the process. So I think a, a point on that, and, and this is something I think, um, that and Helen and I will need to discuss, but I'd love to hear some input from the group. Originally, when we put that um, kind of foundational document together, we landed that we thought a facilitator would be good just to help us with some structure and function, like where our next step should sit. But what I hear Rick saying is that, and we might need to broaden this up a little bit, we're not at the point where we're looking for a facilitator to evaluate and assess our community, our history of work, our way forward, integration into the comprehensive and strategic plan, and then hire the facilitator that will walk alongside us for the next two years to do this work. We were just um, looking for a facilitator to help us orchestrate a listening session between the Human Relations Commission and our task force to figure out what you know, nuts and bolts, what we should look like, where should we fall, and what the recommendation is to the council. So I, I guess I want us to be clear in that RFQ, and when we look for folks, I would think the ones who are bidding on this know that this is just step one and maybe we articulate that in the RFQ so that they know if we do a good job for secure this contract with the city to do this work, we could potentially, since we have history in working with these partners, we could potentially be the firm of choice that continues this diversity and inclusion work for the next two years. But I want it to be clear to even the general public, this is not the end all be all contractor that's going to help us execute diversity and inclusion. This was just a, what do we look like, where are we structured, and where do we fall? Does that make sense? Does everybody understand Do we have some- That more? helped clarify it. That clarified it, uh, Meredith. Yeah. Good explanation. OK, good. I was I was starting to get a little heartburn <laughs> to think about the RFQ that we had to write, but that seems like a 
further down the line next step. And I think to your point, Nina, and to what Rick was saying too, is that you know we we essentially get the chance to write the pie in the sky, but it's up to the vendors to then say, well, I could do all of this and more for this price. And so they need to try to submit the most competitive package and um, um, proposal that they can. And then we come back to the council because we've already been in front of them twice at the study session. Hopefully they will understand the work is vested. There are people who there's general public support from it. And even though our budget is thin, they will work to try to find a way to make it happen. I would hate to do this RFQ process, have a great you know, firm willing to go, and then we have no money to, to execute it. So we have to make that clear, I think, in the study session presentation too. And while you're talking about that, here's just something off the top of my head. You know, when you talk about the funds available for whoever or individual or persons is that will fill the role, consider maybe, you know, when you put out the RFQ and just, just throwing something out for thoughts, publicizing whatever your budget is, just a thought, because then I only say that because, you know, then you get the people that really say, okay, it's worth my time to actually, you know, submit my background, my qualifications. Now that's not saying you're ready to hire and, 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 you know, based on that, because it's just a qualifications request. It's not the actual hiring itself. So I just wanted to put that out there for you since we're, you know, budget conscious. And that's what I meant. I think people need to know where you stand with that. And that's why I always thought a budget had to be there. Budgets are necessary these days. And that's what I meant. We have to put that on something. So people say, oh, I can't do that for that. It kind of lets you know where people stand. And that's why I kept mentioning it. Sorry. Who sets that budget? That's a great question, Thad. So, I mean, I would assume that the city would set the budget. So what I would recommend to this group is maybe incorporating that into your presentation on the 10th on, you know, just putting it out there that there would need to be some sort of set budget set ahead of time in order to be able to issue out the RFQ to get that dialogue rolling. Um, and then, I mean, obviously I'll start working with staff now, but it should, it should at least be kind of incorporated into your study session presentation, but I'll start working on my end to see if I can figure out where we would get that commitment or where, how much that commitment is. Any other questions or comments that we wanna have for item number three on the agenda? Sorry, right, one more. So just, uh, I just wanna know this. So when you've had a study session before on something does anyone remember uh, the amount that was paid to that person or have we ever done that before? I just want to know for my own, because I'm a question ask, asker. I can't, can't really anybody ask. know a number? I was gonna, I think what Excuse you're asking, me? I can't speak for um, the council in previous study sessions, but what I have seen average depending on the work, any kind of consultation fees, usually they charge about 350 to 500 an hour, depending on what they're doing and the level of work. So, I mean, I, I again, we might need to get with Roman and do some research real quick. Again, since we're not doing the bigger plan um, of diversity and inclusion work, but just a facilitator who can facilitate a listening, visioning session, um, the top range I've heard is $500 an hour. And if we're talking about half a day, um, no more than four to five hours to begin, that would be open. Uh, yeah, Something that's what I may I was, be able to possibly nice do here. is to check with um, is just to run this sample RFQ um, by a couple of people just to get a couple figures and I can bring those, send those in an email to the group if that would help. It would definitely help me. Thanks, Roman. No problem. Anything else on item number three? All right, so I think we're we're in good shape. And Meredith, um, Helen, and Thad, whenever you guys are having your subcommittee meetings, if you just include me on those emails, and if you guys have specific agendas, we should probably go ahead and post those as public meetings. And then that's another 
another good opportunity for the group as a whole to be able to not necessarily participate, but they can at least watch and then you don't feel the need to have to constantly send up a bunch of emails if you don't want to do that. And then they have that information available to them as well. So we should post those subcommittee meetings and then we can work on the city side of making sure that they get live streamed so they're accessible to the public. Um, that might also be another piece to your public engagement as well to see if you can kind of get some feedback from people viewing those meetings as well. So that's just something to think about. Um, so that moves us on back to item number two, which is the presentation on police procedures. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Major Ed Turner. And I think he is all geared up to provide that presentation. Oh, hey, before you, Major Turner, you go into your piece, I apologize about interrupting. Do you need anything more from me related to the RFQ process? Because I was getting requested to maybe participate in something else, but I didn't know if, if we were through talking RFQ. Or I think we're good, Rich. I really appreciate you taking your time out this morning to sit with us. And if we have any questions along the way, you can bet that I will be at your office. So. <laughs> okay. No problem. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. All right. Rich. Everybody take care. Mm -hmm. Bye now. Yeah. Hi, Becky. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so sorry I was late last week or last time I was out of town and uh, this morning I had an appointment uh, in Kansas so apologize for that. I um, appreciate everybody's work and uh, on, on the matter and I wanted to just kind of give a rundown and um, of kind of the, the eight can't wait and some of those points um, and happy to uh, have dialogue on this I guess just as a, a baseline um, the I'm just going to give you some some information as we go in, move into it. It's uh, the Bureau of Justice statistics show that there are uh, police contacts um, with citizens over 16 years of age uh, each year is around uh, 50, 53, 54 million uh, people. Uh, police use force in 1.8% of those contacts or those incidences. Um, so just as a rough number and I didn't and I didn't uh, I could drill into these numbers a little bit more but just so you know like we, we will book around uh, 10 11 sometimes 12,000 people a year in our jail so those that's actually people we put handcuffs on we bring into the jail and we book them uh, that doesn't count everybody we contact in the street it doesn't count all the tickets we ride and things so we we use force we uh, have a we call it response to force because responding to the force that's been presented uh we use force maybe 150 200 times a year uh so somewhere around 0.15 percent to maybe 0.2 percent of the time those are just really really rough numbers so if you want me to drill into those i can i was just trying to give you a, a little bit of a, a sketch of uh amount of uh, times that we uh, respond and we, uh, we're required to respond to some type of force when uh, affecting arrests or uh, fulfilling our obligations. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run through uh, each one of these. Um, and so if you would like, uh, we can discuss these, uh, each, each one as we go. I'll uh, kind of present where we're at. Um, and I'll start with probably one of them that'll be, um, I'll just start with one of them that'll probably be more dialogue than others possibly, but I don't know that. Um, so the, the first I'll, I'll bring up is the ban on chokeholds. It's chokeholds and strangleholds. Um, so we, we use uh, restraining techniques. Uh, there's two types of restraining techniques that involve the neck. One is uh, actually affects the respiratory, the breathing. Uh, the second one is the vascular uh, neck restraint. Uh, we've used the, uh, uh, it's called the lateral vascular neck restraint. Uh, Independence has used that for, uh, it's been out for 50 years. Uh, in those 50 years that I've got the, I've got the uh, citations to back these up. I'm not just, just making them up, but, um, and I can share that with you another time. But for over 50 years, uh, there has not been any incident of death, serious injury or litigation attributed to the lateral vascular neck restraint. Um, it's, it differs from a chokehold, uh, because it, it, it addresses the circulatory and not the airway. 
There's no obstruction. In fact, it actually protects the airway when it's done correctly. Uh, we have a lot of policy against in, uh, inappropriate use of force that uh, all the officers that would use a lateral vascular neck restraint receive a certification uh, uh, continuously throughout their career to, uh, to properly use it. If they haven't been trained in it, just like a taser or a less lethal weapon, uh, they're not uh, permitted to use that. That, that uh, so, and then just a little more information on that. Um, like there's, there's quite a bit on it, but uh, and I'll just tell you some of the things that we had looked at. I know a Canadian study had, was done with five major forces of options uh, used by law enforcement. And the, uh, uh, just for ease of conversation, we call it the LVNR. So if I hear me say LVNR, I'm, I'm referring to the lateral vascular neck restraint, not a, not an airway chokehold. Uh, but the LVNR was found in the Canadian study to be the second safest uh, um, force used uh, in regards to the lack of uh, injury to a suspect. Um, one of the things that we found is uh, smaller framed officers dealing with a larger frame suspect. Oftentimes, we, if, we always try to have a second officer there, but unfortunately, I've seen many times when that doesn't happen. We've had a smaller uh, a male officer or a smaller female officer that is uh, find themselves in a in a uh, altercation or this this a fight with a uh, suspect and they they've had to use that 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 uh, technique uh, to help uh, gain control. Um, one of the hurdles too we find and again I'm, I'm i'm throwing i'm not saying that i'm not trying to shut down uh, i'm just throwing out something i'm not trying to shut down anybody from having a, you know obviously uh, adverse uh, thoughts or comments about it but i'm just sh sharing some things that we've found in our study in our practice is that um, we found that suspects under the influence of drugs or alcohol uh, lack any pain compliance so our empty hand techniques oftentimes do not work uh, and are ineffective, um, mainly just because the pain receptors are affected and they don't have the ability to uh, to gain control of the subject. So uh, just a little bit further, the circulatory system is, is uh, obviously doesn't affect the pain receptors, but it uh, gives a way to gain control. In fact, most of the time when we say, uh, when I say LVNR, uh, we, we never even get to a point of applying uh, pressure that affects blood flow. It's the first thing that we do is we take them off center. They're off their their balance is is pulled backwards, so they're the they're not able to take an offensive uh, fight towards the officer. So generally, we don't even um, fully apply what would be termed a LVNR. We still document it anytime we encircle anyone uh, with around the neck that uh, we we document that. And then I'll elaborate on that just a little bit more as we get down in some of these other points. But um, uh, so the one of the things that would be a concern uh, if the LVNR was banned would be um, the, the the force incidents potentially could it, the, the actual lethal force could I'm not saying it would, but there's a potential that it could increase uh, because when you have a smaller officer, they may have to go to a higher level force, which could be a firearm. Um, instead of using a, a, a certified move that would be uh, useful in bringing, bringing a situation, a physical threat under control. Um, there's a actually, I think it was Channel 5. I'm not sure. I don't know if any of you saw that report done a few weeks ago. Uh, they did it. They went up to the Kansas City Academy and they gave it, and the Kansas City gave a, a demonstration and uh, kind of articulated what is involved in terms of a, a lateral vascular neck restraint versus a, an airway chokehold, and um, I thought they—I thought it was a pretty good explanation. Of course, um, I've—I've been—I've—I've um, I've, I've used, I've been around, I've been been certified on the LVNR for 25 years, um, and um, again, I've uh, used it. I've seen other people use it. Um, normally, like I said, rarely do people ever go unconscious, but it—it it is. Uh, one thing that uh, we we have an effect that uh, I'll just bring this up now. I'll, it's also later in my notes, but uh, anytime we apply the LVNR now, we an, uh, an ambulance is called, a uh, supervisor responds to the scene, uh, pictures are taken, um, 
a, re a thorough report is done, it, not just the LVNR, any use of force, this, these things apply. Um, and this comes up later in one of the bullets that I wanted to touch on as far as reporting out. Um, that report is then uh, the, the first line sergeant, the supervisor interviews the officer, uh, pulls any, any uh, they take pictures of everything, they pull any video from the cars or if any video is available around that and they review, then they'll, they'll review those things that are available to them. And then they write a recommendation that goes up to the captain. The captain does all the same, looks at all the video, looks at all the pictures, reads the reports. The captain will evaluate it and it'll, it'll go up the chain to the major, the major, uh, which is my seat, gets that report, depends on which division it's coming through. Then the, I, I would sign off as a major, then it goes to the deputy chief. The deputy chief reviews, um, all the reports, the, the videos and the pictures, and then it goes to the chief and then the chief reviews it and he will be the final sign off on that. And from there, it goes over to our uh, internal affairs uh, department and they, they take the information review it and they, they pull it, put it into a, um, a database so we can track uh, what was original contact for, what was the, um, uh, what, why were we there was the self-initiated, was a call generated, were there drugs, were there uh, the size of the person, um, the type, any weapons were used. Again, it, and that's, I can send you all one of our use of force reports, but um, that was a flyby, if you will, on, on that particular uh, bullet. And I can tell you that on the uh, eight can't wait, um, we're, we're doing majority of these. Uh, there's some of them that um, we'll get into later. Uh, like the warning shots and stuff that uh, uh, could have some more dialogue, could have more discussion. But um, I think as we dissect this, this could obviously go on a lot. I wish we were in person. It sure makes it easier for me to have this conversation. Um, but I would kind of just on that first um, that first bullet of eight can't wait. I just wanted to take time to get feedback from you and and start dialogue on uh, how, how we might improve or things that uh, you've heard or would like to know. And I may not have the answer, but I can, I can try to get the answer and get back to you on it. Meredith made a, uh, had put a question into the comments. Um, Meredith, did you want to give that to Major Turner directly or did you just want him to read that? It's a good question. Oh, thanks, Dad. No, I, um, so while you were talking, I was familiar with the LVNR, um, um, tactic and looked on the National Law Enforcement Training Center website and, and it looks like it's usually done standing um, or kneeling or on the ground, but it's predominantly from behind using the arms, elbow and the fist to lock the restraint. Um, is there ever any approved use of force that involves law enforcement either kneeling or at applying any pressure to the neck? I think just generally knowing that this meeting is being publicized and I know the general public may have some questions or thoughts about that. I think our education is important because I don't know anything about holds. And so is there any time ever that that is a approved use of restraint? That's a wonderful question. And um, the answer is like what we saw where this, a lot of the stem from, we saw in Minneapolis that it was, that was illegal. That was a criminal act. Um, now, Will I say in the midst of a, a full fight that you don't spin around, you end up on somebody and, and your knee slides up, but you immediately you reposition. I mean, uh, because of the dynamics of a conflict, um, you don't always get to end up where you fall on somebody. So, but that doesn't mean you stay there. Uh, we, we do uh, teach a pinning uh, a technique with the shin and the, and the lower part of the knee across the shoulder blades that would help hold the person down but we do not, we do not, uh, it's, it's against policy for anyone to use a, a knee to hold anyone's neck down. And those are dealt with when we watch video, um, you know, uh, if there anything would come up that's questionable, it might be a training situation where we're saying, hey, um, you know, maybe another officer was, uh, there was another officer there, he, he really need, maybe somebody need to reposition to get on the other side to help control another arm. But uh, yeah, it's a great question. So yes, if, I don't know if that answered your question, but we do not permit uh, anyone's knee on the neck uh, as a technique to hold somebody. But I, I do want to have a caveat to know, to, to understand that 
in the midst of a full fight when somebody's grabbing at you your gun and hitting at you that when you spin around you might end up on their back and for a moment you might be in a position where your legs are on that but that is not uh, allowed to stay uh, when you're going into a to handcuffing or control technique if that makes sense and i'm not i'm not trying to make a, a window of an out i'm just being realistic that things happen that way no that was very straightforward thank you And I, I would definitely be willing and able to, um, um, I, I, don't, I don't say this to try to even try to convince you that everything we're doing is right. I, I would just, for, in terms of education, to have a greater understanding uh, moving forward to even have ability to, to demonstrate that, what that looks like, uh, what is actually taught um, in any of the, um, we have all the, the, the documents from, from doctors and all the, the, the legal process in terms of uh, the LVNR versus a chokehold. So um, those are kind of where we're at right now. We don't, if anybody's uh, is doing a LVNR and it, and it repositions to out of, you're not in position to maintain what, the, what you're certified to do, then you're not to maintain that position. You're gonna have to readdress and, and try something else. Of course, if it is life-threatening and they have a weapon, um, then obviously that, that would rise the level of force similar to um, you know, elevating to a, a firearm. But uh, that by and large, we find that um, we generally don't even have to go to um, putting full full uh, pressure on anyone's neck once you you take them off balance they generally recognize that they're not able to fight anymore and, and they they start to comply but there are those that are intoxicated under with pcp and i can tell you stories of, of just this really really struggle and i guess just briefly i don't just so you have an idea is people don't have their pain receptors are not working. And so we literally have broke a person's arm, people's arm before trying to just do an arm bar. And they don't even feel that they're, they don't even, they don't recognize their strength and they don't feel pain. And so uh, there have been times when those that are on PCP or other types of drugs, uh, stimulants that it's just, it's an almost unhuman type strength that you're dealing with. And it's difficult. Again, those aren't excuses. It's not to say that there aren't room for improvement. I'm just mentioning that as an example of times. So, um, what other things have you heard or questions you have in regards to that, or would, uh, what would be helpful for you at this point to, to, to be in a best position to, to move forward, uh, if you know that at all, I don't know if you know what you would need to know, <laughs> um, if that makes sense, but happy to uh, try to provide whatever that is. Major Turner, one of my questions would be, um, once, a, once a person is under control and in restraints, how quickly is that person returned from if they're in a prone position on their stomachs, how quickly does the department get them then from that position, either into a sitting position or off their stomachs? Because I know that places a person's um, respiratory system in distress to be on their stomachs for a prolonged period of time. Yeah, and that's another great question. And I'm sorry, who was asking that? I'm, I'm sorry, this is Helen Hurley. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Helen. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, we we actually have policy, and I'm willing to share that policy with any of you as well. It's it's available. Uh, that there, it's policy to to get a person up once they are secured uh, and set them upright. We know that positional fixation or uh, excited delirium is something that you can do a little research on that and just type that and so excited delirium. We know that when people are in the influence of stimulus or some type of um, Alt, um, mind altering drug or that uh, their, their hearts can be in a position that uh, uh, are, are further stressed after a fight and the adrenaline and the, their, and their, um, their heart rates up. So it's, it is our policy. If they don't set them up, they actually, we, in our, in our reviews, uh, we actually either do remedial training or it could move into uh, a, even a, 
a personnel issue, policy issue, or, uh, a discipline issue if if, it, if it's not being addressed. So, um, but yeah, that's that's a great question too. Does that does that answer that, Helen? It did. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate that information, uh, Turner. And I just want to make a comment that um, although the incidents of George Floyd and, um, and such are the ones that raise the most attention is that um, in regards to the MOU and the purpose of the group is that we were looking at the broad range of scope of police procedures um, and policies in different ways <clears throat> um, to incorporate those for more diversity and inclusion. Um, and I know that we, when we last talked um, before COVID, is that, that we were trying to get access to many of the procedures and to figure out a way to have those become electronic and more visible um, to the public for transparency. Has there been any efforts to that regard? And is that something that we can continue to um, pick up to move forward um, as we move through this process? Oh, oh, sure. Um, I know we have shared all of those policies. Uh, what I could do is I, I shared the policies with the uh, uh, Community Concerned Citizens Group. Uh, they were in that that circle. We we handed we I thought we gave them out to this group, but if we haven't, we will. Um, but we have a lot of policy. You can look at any policies. What I, my thought would be to give you a list, just a bullet list of all the policy that would just show you what they're about, uh, give you the ones that are probably going to be the ones that you would be most interested in. And you can have all those, you can have all of them anyways, if electronically, I guess it doesn't matter, but it can be kind of tedious to get through a lot of the, some of the policy. It could be something about just, um, you know, putting property in or how do you secure something and again not, not that you can't have any of them I just um, I can pick out the ones that I know that we get requested on the most and and give those out and, and then a, a complete list um, however you want to do that you let me know what you want and we can make it happen I believe the last time we discussed is that we were because um, I looked at Kansas City's with Rebecca and they actually have a way to where all the procedures are available online and I think that would be a um, a good end goal um, at the end of the process to have those be available for transparency purposes so yes giving those to the group um, that that would be key and I believe that um, you suggested the same thing last time. I just want to keep in mind a larger vision of making those accessible for the public, um, those who aren't familiar with our policies or even how to get them, just to make those easily accessible. And so that is kind of my focus um, in this. And so if we can make steps toward that, toward that reality, uh, I think that would serve the most benefit to the public. Sure thing. No, I, no problem. I, um, I, I encourage you to, if something comes to you on that first bullet um, in regards to uh, two different types of neck restraints that I, I addressed, um, please feel free to, to come chime back in and, and let me know if something comes to you. Um, I, no no question. I, I want you also <laughs> feel comfortable. Don't, I mean, I think most of you, I know most of you, you're not going to offend me if you say something that's that's uh, you know that's challenging. I may you know may or may not like it. Doesn't matter if I like it. If you have a question, I'd rather you ask it so we can put it out there and just have dialogue on it. Um, and so uh, you know we don't do everything right, but we're working to to work with everybody so we can do what we need to do to like like Roman said, share these things, uh, whatever we can do to help that communication. Um, I. <laughs> I had, oh, who's talking? Sad. You can go. You can go. It's okay. Um, I, when you said that um, after one of those holds was used, then a ambulance is called and then a supervisor comes. Um, my internet was cutting out a little bit, so I may have missed this. But if 
the person is in distress, are officers required to render aid until that emergency services gets there? Does that make sense? If yeah. they started to have issues. A medical emergency. Yes. Is that, re is that expected of the officers to render that until, I mean, which is probably very rare, but until the emergency services do get there? Uh, uh, yeah, in fact, it's more than, it, it's required, it's in policy that when that happens, we are required, if they don't, then they're out of policy and they're subject to discipline. Uh, and so that is a, a mandate, if you will. Um, so that's a good, another good, y'all have some good questions and, and uh, hopefully that, um, that can be relayed in ways that understand that, in fact, that happens a lot officers, and I say a lot. I know you said it, it doesn't happen very often and I, you know, um, but it, it happens, it can happen several times, several times a year where you're having to now deal with somebody that's having a, a possible medical emergency or something. And I don't have the numbers. I say several, I don't know, maybe a few times, uh, but where you're getting involved and you, you immediately turn from being assaulted, handcuffing, and then you're giving first aid to the person and sometimes it involves that person, uh, you know, even we've had times when we've had to use lethal force on people and, and they just tried to hurt the officer and they had to use lethal force. And now you've got their blood all over you because you're trying to save them and, 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 you know, it just escalated so fast. So, um, yeah, so it is mandated that they, they reply, uh, with uh, medical care until a higher level gets arrives, they treat them. So. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And so for me, I, and that gave a little bit of answer to it, but so I guess the only reason I'm giving this is that should anybody in the public be seeing this? And I think a lot of concern that I see in all the, in the, in the movement and everything. So when all policy and procedures have failed, and there's in that very, very, very small percentage and something like George Floyd happens in the city of Independence. And because an officer went rogue and had a bad day, I don't know, but um, disciplinary actions, how, I want, how does the Independence enforce disciplinary actions for officers who aren't following the policy and procedure? Um, sure. So. Uh... Um, I, I, I always, I tell officers this when they come on new or even maybe they've been there a while is that, um, you and I, we can't drive down the road w without violating a law somewhere. Uh, you've got, we got stacks of ordinances and laws on the books and, uh, things happen. And I, I think one of our old chiefs may have said it best. There's times it's kind of like a, y y so I guess what I'm saying, you can't, you're going to, there are going to be some policy violations from time to time. Uh, rather it's they didn't turn one like for example uh, and this is a very minor one somebody jumps out of their car and they didn't have their mic pack synced meaning it's not connected to the system that's recording the audio so we don't know what was said well that's a problem well that might not rise to a, a critical discipline but it may be capturing pieces of think that are that are relevant that you it's mandatory that they have their mic packs on so um, something minor like that is dealt with, you know, might start with a verbal, verbal reprimand saying, uh, or verbal counseling saying, Hey, your mic packs off. You need to make sure you have it charged or you need to have it synced or you need to have it on. Sometimes there are technical issues that happen that the system just will have to reset and then it doesn't reconnect. But sometimes it's, it's, it is, it could be officers, um, because of their operation of the system. So, uh, I guess. And then we have times that if it's elevated to a point that there it's abuse um, uh, of someone's civil liberties uh, or excessive force, they are fired. <laughs> you know, we and we just and uh, I don't not the air dirty laundry, but we had that happen last year where uh, there wasn't even a there was some there was an issue that arose that uh, caused concern. Um, but, um, the officer basically was terminated because of, uh, because of their actions and they, they filed a grievance and it went through a grievance procedure and, um, 
the the uh, the city withheld that 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 decision to terminate that officer because of decisions that wasn't uh, wasn't a, even an excessive force type of situation that uh, was documented, but it, it was something that uh, went beyond the scope of uh, the expectation that we have for officers in service to the community. Uh, and I know I don't know if I'm getting to your 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 point, Thad. But if I'm not, you can refocus me. But uh, basically, it, it just varies depending on the seriousness of the offense, um, on what has transpired. Um, but if you know, we 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 use somewhat of a uh, would be called a progressive discipline, where if it's a minor issue, you, you're just going to do a verbal, say, hey, let's not do that next time you know it's uh you know i told you last time this is last time i if it's something real minor we're not going to do that again and then it goes it might go on paper but that might escalate sooner depending on the nature of the offense and i don't know if that helps any that or if that made it worse no, it does. it's just a, i think it, it was more important just to have this conversation and especially when we're seeing things like brianna taylor um when and just a lack of accountability for officers sometimes um, I think that's important that public people know that, um, at least because we're coming from the reference of the City of Independence, um, that the City of Independence has accountability for officers. And I think um, that's that's the point I was trying to make, just to let sure that you know, people hear that there is an accountability for the City of Independence and the officers. And can I ask you something, Ed, only because my computer turned off. I'm just coming back to the conversation. So let me know if it's repetitive. You want me to start over, Nina? That's what I'm hearing. I know. I know. And that's horrible. <laughs> Chief computers, you know, what can I say? I argued about it already. Uh, I wanted to ask this. Like Brianna Taylor and uh, the two young ladies and their children the other day, those were both mistakes. The young lady that was on TV the other day, her uh, her and her sister and their children uh, for a stolen car. Now, and I understand why they were pulled over. And I've been pulled over many times in Independence, but not any longer, like I said. But it was the exact, <laughs> it was the exact um, license plate number, exactly. But the stolen car was from another state. So it's a mistake. But with that mistake, all of the children were, uh, and they didn't know it was a mistake, of course, but for a stolen car, all the children were put on the ground, eight-year-olds too, in handcuffs, face down on the hot heat pavement, and um, the two young ladies, and they're all African-American. And this would be my question is, I know mistakes happen, but like with children, is there a protocol for children? Is there a protocol, a no-knock warrants? Do we do those? the little things could be tweaked a little so they wouldn't happen. Brianna Taylor just did not have to happen. That was horrible to go into her house in the middle of the night. If anybody comes in my house in the middle of the night, if I can't get to something, something's gonna happen. That was one of the most horrible, but seeing those little children on that heated path, and this was a mistake again, but a legitimate mistake, same exact, but different state. How can an independence we respect people a little bit more level wise. Do we have, do we do no knocks that come into people's houses at night? And also if there's some eight year olds or 10 year olds, are we going to put them on the ground? You know Ed, what I'm saying? Cause I, I know you wouldn't want your children or my grandchildren on the ground face down in the heat. I feel like the answer is we don't do any of that, but could you let me know? I just like basic scenarios. I'm a scenario person. Could you, you know, do that one for me, Ed? Yeah, so I had a couple. I, I pulled a couple different things out of what you're saying. Um, so we we are we do uh, uh, utilize no knock warrants on whenever necessary. Uh, now those are those are approved. We don't get to we don't get to pick that. Uh, those are approved by the judge. The prosecutor and the judge have to sign off on those. Um, based on the information that that is relevant. So we just had a no knock warrant. Um, uh, two weeks ago, they they're rare. They do happen, uh, but we have people that uh, are armed with guns. We had a guy with a, and I, I may not get my. I'm trying to remember. I'm not in investigations, uh, as uh, and so I don't always get all the details of all the nuances that lead up to the getting the warrant. But um, I get briefed on them. Uh, you know, we had a, a homicide suspect that 
uh, out of another state and they're in town and then we know they've got multiple guns and all of our people say they carry a gun on them and they've got they're going to have it on them when you get them and they made all and then we we get statements from other people saying this is what he said is going to happen if the police come and he's probably you know he's he's articulated this to other people and again all those scenarios are different but we we take the information we get and we put it in a report and we send it to the prosecutor to get them to approve a, a warrant and they would have to do the no knock exemption uh for that we don't get to pick that um okay. you know we we may ask for it because we know that when we go in that um they're gonna have the upper hand by sitting at the door knocking and waiting a reasonable amount of time for somebody to come to the door because of the nature of their, the violence, which they've already demonstrated. Um, but no knocks are rare, very rare. I don't, I don't, I, I could go get to the numbers and tell you how many of them we do, but if we do one a year, uh, maybe a couple a year, it just, I, I don't know. I, I shouldn't even say a number. Uh, you know, we, we do some each year, but by and large, most of them are, are knock and announce warrants. Um, and you have checks and balances. Well, yeah, we, yeah, we, we, okay. we don't, get to, we don't get to pick those. Uh, the, the prosecutor has to send, has to recognize the need for it. Then, then they would, they would give an endorsement and it would go to the judge and the judge would see it and he would sign off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I see, I, I see this person's record. I see they've had this, this, this lengthy, uh, violent history so um, I, I can see the need not to be standing outside uh, waiting for this person that's already killed somebody and known to be armed to and again th all those situations are different I'm just telling you the one that happened a couple of weeks ago and that's a reasonable that's so reasonable I'm a reasonable person but I'd like checks and balances and that was the wrong address and so that's that's always going to stand out on my mind and then so many uh, black uh, men and women getting shot, you know, for cigarettes. They stole the cigarette. They just, so, and I know you're a thoughtful person. So you're the person I need to say, that's just not acceptable. And that's why I kind of like well, to know, you know I, what's I, going I, on. I can't tell you, the, I can't tell you the precipice of what initiated the contact with police. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's the actions of the person that, st that stems into what the disposition is going to be. I mean, the police don't co I mean, show, co show up and, initiate you know lethal force something has has initiated that that contact has gone bad and, and we can get into de-escalation that's the next one on here but uh, oh. ultimately we our goal is to de-escalate we have training in that ever uh, through you know throughout everyone's career we we are trained on uh, particularly uh, we have had that in a CIT which is a critical incident team deals with mentally uh, disturbed uh, mental health issues um, and as we are trained on dealing with those if the same same principles apply. It's uh, I kind of call it time, distance, and shielding. If we can give time to something, uh, if if that's allotted, meaning we have if we have dialogue with somebody, that's a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I often ask this question. I'll ask it to any of you. Do you all know what the the acronym SWAT stands for? Mm -mm. Anybody know? No. Well, it it, it actually originally it's it stood for. Um, special weapons and tactics but uh, after being involved with the SWAT team for over 20 years different roles is uh, it really means sit wait and talk uh, so when we go in somebody's barricaded in a house uh, negotiators are doing all the work we're just there in case it doesn't go well or they start to use violence or they they try to use uh, force on somebody so I, I you know kind of make light of that but quite honestly uh, that's a lot of what we do. We sit, wait, and talk, and whenever, but sometimes uh, the situation doesn't allow that because of what's being presented, and we can only go off the information we're given. For example, uh, we could have somebody that says, um, you know, I have somebody in here, and, and I'm going to I'm gonna take their life at a certain time or something similar to hostage situation, or then... Uh, we don't like those situations uh, because it. We now have to weigh. Uh, I, I my litmus test is if that is my daughter in that house, what would I want the police to do to save their life? And if it was good for my child, then I'm going to have to respond. And I, they, and they may not. They may be pull, uh, It may be a bluff. It may be something they're just saying that just to hold us at bay. But 
and they don't understand that 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 dials it up in terms that we now have trying to protect somebody's life again again those things are very rare and so that's not i, I mentioned that not like it's a common thing but it uh, basically to say that uh, although i time distance and shielding or time distance and cover position meaning uh, protection from uh, a threat from a suspect is good but a lot of times we, those might be taken away from us because of the nature of the situation that's presented. And uh, we find that we're in the middle of a road as a car is driving at us <laughs> and you, you just, you have, you respond because uh, there's no, no way to get out of, there's no time and you don't have the distance to move and there's no cover to get away from that. And so you respond um, anyway. So if, if you want, I can kind of work through these other bullets. I'm sorry. I've taken so much time. Uh, hopefully any, you know, some useful dialogue and, Oh, let me, Nina, before I forget, I wanted to talk about, you talked about proning. We call it proning, meaning laying prone on the ground uh, when it's hot. I, I, I can't speak to the situation that you're talking about. I haven't seen that video. Um, I've been, I just got back this, yesterday is my first day back. And um, so uh, I was out of town. Um, and you got week. me. I feel I'm sorry not, for you. <laughs> not making excuses. I just can't speak on what you're speaking about. Happy to look at it and, and, and have dialogue about it after I see it. But uh, we, there's oftentimes uh, we would, we, we put people in a position that um, we have them in a submissive position, meaning we may not, we may have too many people to handcuff, but we have a car or we have a vehicle or we have a house or something that has a threat, possible threat in it. So in turn, we try to get people in a non-threatening position so we can deal with the other threats because we haven't had time to secure the threats that are there. And, and sometimes actually lying a, ch a child down, again, I, I can't speak to the issue at hand, is if something happens, they're out of the way. If, some, if something rises up and the officers have to um, use some type of force or they have a better, uh, clearer view that a child's now not in danger between a threat area and what they're dealing with. And so again, I, I'm sorry, I can't speak to the issue at hand, but we've had issues where, you know, we, we, you know, come uh, May and around May or so we had the, our cars are black and they're running all day and just putting somebody's hands on a car can be an issue. You know, normally we put them there because, uh, for police officers, we we watch their hands. We know hands are areas that somebody wants to bring harm to us. It's it's, it's going to likely going to stem from their hands. So, if we have their their weight is being they're bearing their weight with their hands or their hands are seen, then we feel like we have a better um, situational awareness that at least their hands don't have a weapon in them. Uh, but to to your point is at times even in the summertime we have to watch putting their hands on the cars for any long period of time because it, it is hot. So we try to respond to that and same with asphalt. So um, those are things that we do. I don't know. I just want to touch base on that when trying to skip over that, but happy to talk more about it. Um, okay, so let me run through these other ones and then we can um, we can keep talking. So uh, the number, uh, the second one was uh, required de-escalation. Uh, I kind of already alluded to that with our mental health protocols and the things that we do with our CIT officers. Um, I, I will say that oftentimes, uh, the, and I again alluded to this, that uh, situations don't provide opportunity for us to, to fully de-escalate um, because of the nature of someone's aggressive and I can show you a video of our officers that somebody jumped out of a car on, on multiple occasions and started shooting at the officer. Well, I mean, obviously there's no de-escalation of that. You just, you're already in a, in a lethal force situation. <clears throat> so, but at times, you know, when you deal with those people that are in crisis, mental health crisis, or um, it could be uh, training on domestic violence. Uh, for example, we know that uh, when we arrive, and if if a, if a, if a lady had been a, been getting abused, uh, the there's a circle of violence, and I won't try to get into all of it. But you're going to show up and say, for example, say the male is the one that was the uh, aggressor, and the and the and the wife was uh, was the victim. She's going to be irate and out of control and blowing up, and he's going to be calm. This isn't the case all the time, but this this is likely can happen. Well she can look like she's out of control to the point that and we're trying to de-escalate those situations just so we can get the investigation underway so uh officers are 
de escalation is something that uh, we we have officers do, and it's it's really necessary for us to do our job. Um, and were there any particular points on um, de escalation that you thought that you've heard or seen or wanted to touch base on, Casey? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, with de escalation, um, I've experienced with a neighbor that it wasn't used um, very well and he was having a mental health crisis and we had when we had called the police we um, told the dispatcher that kind of a well check and um, that to expect that that it was a mental health issue most likely my husband works um, in that field and he, they actually use de-escalating a lot because they don't have any type of weapons or anything to help them but they deal with um, clients sometimes that are very volatile, volatile and um, aggressive because of various different things so anyways um how i know that there are that officers are being trained with um cit training um but is it, I feel like, um, what is the status with the police and CIT and having mental health, um, maybe other organizations helping out with some of these situations? Because I feel, it seems like um, there isn't enough in that help that with the mental health um, area, for police officers to actually utilize those things because there's just, it's, you know, that there's just, I don't know if there's not enough funding, if there's not enough actual CIT officers at, like at nighttime. Um, it just, it feels like it should be a way that the police officers are going, but it seems like it's, we're not there yet where it's being utilized as much as it could be. And I don't know if that's lack of funding, lack of, you know, whatever. Yeah, and I, I know there's others on this call on our meeting here that could probably speak to this too, but we, we have um, a co we work hand in hand with um, a comprehensive mental health. Uh, they, we partner with them and they partner with us. So we, they have one of their employees that is embedded with the police department. It's called a co responder. Uh, a lot of times we try to bring her, uh, try to bring Heather into it because uh, that's that's her job. Uh, she tries to take uh, a, some of the burden off of, you know, the, the mental health crisis. And because we know that when we can get them into services sooner, then we can reduce the call. And I can give you an example. We had um, some years back, four or five years ago, we had a person that had, I think they were in a range of it was something like 400 calls for the year and it's just an amazing number and, and every time you have a call that's two police officers and on numerous times there's an ambulance and a fire truck going they'll think about how many resources get tied up in that and i don't mean to get off track here but and so with the co-responder you know we found that well we we didn't have co-responder then but we have a cit officer that's dedicated that's their full-time job and then they work with other officers but we can reduce the, reduce that and the, the next the next year i think we had two or three calls with them uh because we get him into services so i think that's where our co-responder is so important uh we've just applied with a uh with for a grant and uh with uh, mark and we uh we're, we're in the process of getting a second co-responder so we could use an army of co-responders probably but um unfortunately they're gonna a lot of those situations are going to require us to go first and they may come in behind us or with us and, and try to resolve that so that we're not going back there time and time again. Um, but yeah, there, it, in some of it, it's a funding issue uh, and it's uh, a treatment issue, trying to get the resources in line so that people do not, and they're not always gonna go right, you know, like you said, I mean, I, um, it, it just, unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't go as, as well as we'd like um, but those are the areas that we try to build on when we know about them and, and get better because of it. So, Do you know, um, as citizens, how would we um, help support or campaign for that, for the officers so that they would have that type of, um, like, I mean, do we 
you know, I mean, is there organizations that we would support or encourage or reach out to to say that this is something that we would like our police officers to have more access to? Is it something that we, you know, email the chief about? I mean, who would we, as citizens, um, show that that's what we would like for our police officers to have as um, a tool? Um, do you have any ideas on that? So uh, really, uh, from my perspective, it's a it's a federal issue. There's going to have to be some federal uh, initiative to to get the support to the local communities. Um, you know, I guess you could petition the state. Um, I think uh, Julie Pratt, who's the who oversees comprehensive mental health, uh, she she's my go to and she she knows she knows all the right strings to pull to get what she can. And even then, uh, we're just looking for support at higher levels to have the funding in place to, to respond to the needs of the community. And there are a lot of mental health and we are our homeless, uh, our community service officers do a lot with the homeless outreach. And a lot of those issues uh, end up, they there's overlapping issues in their life that have to deal with uh, mental, uh, mental health, mental illness. So, but yeah, I, I would start working it's going to be a it's a there's no immediate money there's no local money um now the hospitals have uh there is uh, the ford foundation uh that may be getting that wrong there's uh, there's some funding out there uh through the hospital uh foundation that they've tapped into um but again i don't know if that helps any thank you yep uh, I did have one question, Turner, in regards to, um, let's say an officer does get convicted um, and there are suits, I guess, against the officer. Uh, what is the say, city's uh, just... current position in regards to, um, I guess, abuse of power or, or let's say like with the George Floyd incident where there are punitive damages that are sought by the family as the city on the hook for those or is the officer held liable for paying those back uh, so when you said um, when they're convicted are you talking about civil or criminal type of charge or i guess it would be either while being in the line of duty so yeah so if they're outside of policy uh they're they they could be subject to uh to um we've had that happen i've I've been a commander and I've had to testify in federal court and a uh, civil rights violation and testify against the officer that, that you know, we'd like to do, but um, there are times that it, ex you know, they, they exceed the scope of uh, uh, what's, what's allowed. But I, I know that um, if they're within policy and uh, then the city's going to support their role uh, in what transpired. So there, I mean, the city's going to be in, involved in those civil, regardless of what happens, anyways. Uh, but uh, they're going to have a, a piece of that. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I, I, I touched on this earlier. Um, uh, and the number three I have is a requiring a warning shot before. Um, uh, I mean, many times officers are giving multiple commands to the to the person. Uh, the only organization I say reputable, the only known uh, organization that uh, that policies are drawn from that has come out and and supported warning shots is Perf. Um, but it is a organization that helps to or helps and we work a lot with um international association of chiefs of police i it's called the iacp but we um we also recognize that again going back to the situations are so uh fluid that there's times you don't you don't have time to give do something like a warning shot uh we it's not in our policy to give a warning shot um and for example um there's a there's an organization called force science that studies uh, how force is used and the response to force 
And uh, one example they gave was a person with a firearm within um, can draw from a console area and have it pointed at the officers in 0.15 seconds. And it would take the officer 0.25 seconds to even respond. Uh, and you know, obviously in those those uh, quick instances, there's not the opportunity to, uh, but we it does go back to the de-escalation that if we try to dialogue, even if, it, well, I can tell you time and time and time again, multiple times each year, uh, dozens of times, uh, officers could ha will have somebody with a weapon, gun or a knife, and they're trying to dialogue with them and to resolve the issue. Um, but again, warning shot is something that is uh, not something that is in our policy. But I'm, I don't know if you all had thoughts on that. Of course, we have we have less lethal weapons like a taser and a bean bag. That would be uh, and other options that we would use, or a, a, some type of chem, chemical munition like pepper spray that they carry on their holster. But we don't have warning shots. Does anybody have any thoughts on warning shots, or we can come back to it if you think of something? Uh, I do know that. I guess uh, wasn't there a while back where officers were trained to keep their finger off the trigger um, to allow, um, I guess, more time, that extra split second to think about a shot? Um, and then what are other non-lethal approaches, um, whether it's a warning shot or something like that, could, that could procedurally be put in place um, to, I guess, hold the officers accountable, but to actually um, change the procedure and how police deal with those particular incidences where there is time to actually provide a warning shot or a non-lethal approach as opposed to um, lethal approaches to dealing with that. So what was the first part of that question again? I had something and then I got sidetracked. If you could. Um, is, I know um, from my understanding there was, I guess, training um, in the past to have officers keep the finger off the tree, yeah. but are there any other um, procedural things in place um, that could be put in place in regards to use of non-lethal force or warning shot or something like that? Um, you know, I think we, we, we do not train to put your finger on the trigger. In fact, it's, uh, there's four cardinal rules of firearm safety and they have, they have to, sometimes our training officer, firearm strings officer, have them repeat that every time they go to the range. But one of those safety rules is you, you never put your finger inside the trigger guard or on the trigger until you are ready to fire. Um, and so, because we have what's called sympathetic squeeze, and this is probably more technical than you care to know, but I could, if I had my, if I had my finger on the trigger with my right hand and I reach and grab something quick with my left hand, you have a sympathetic squeeze that happens in our body sometimes where you actually are squeezing the other hand because there's so much uh, initiative on the other side. And, and so we, it, it would, it would be, a, it would be a, it would be a, I'll say a, a range safety violations if a range officer sees somebody on the firearms course uh, with their finger on the trigger when they're not ready to fire. Um, again, that's just so there is a reactionary time there uh, that happens. Um, but again, I, uh, and I can tell you from my personal experience, I've had a guy wanting us to kill him, and uh, it was dark, and we we're in the back of a house, and uh, if I wasn't behind a welding truck where I felt I had good cover in some distance, I, I may have fired. I started putting the finger on the trigger, and I thought I was going to have to shoot him because he would reach in his pocket and pull something out real quick and point it at us and trying to get us to be a, a comb or you get a cell phone, and he was trying to get us to kill him, and we're trying not to. And just to end that part of the story, we were able to distract him one side while somebody else came up and tackled him from the back where he didn't see him coming. So um, I guess to answer that last part of that question, uh, Roman, is that I think when we can have uh, more officers there, uh, we have the ability to use different techniques to try to uh, mitigate the situation so we don't have to use lethal force uh, because it's called divided attention. And if we, it, you, they they can only focus on one person at a time. So if one person can try to try to uh, try to 
get them in custody while they're focused on the other person. I mean, those are that that doesn't happen a lot, but um, I mean, I can I, I know it happens from personal experience that if you have more than one person there, the ability for you to have a better response is is uh, is going to be likely going to be the outcome. <laughs> Yeah, can I, I ask you all that? Go, go ahead, Nina. Um, you know, uh, I like being proactive, and this is a pie in the sky type thing. And I've always thought about it and, and talked about it. When people leave, the best thing I think to do is have less people that have a need to go, you know, to jail, whether they're on drugs, whether they need money to feed their families or whatever. And do we have anything in, in place that, I always said there should be a sheet or something, or they have to contact, you know, someone that's not a hardened criminal going, you know, to jail, I guess, for 100 years, where they can contact people like Helen. They can contact people, you know, about food or whatever. Give people some hope instead of keep redoing things. I do believe in America that people of color are targeted because of whatever is perceived on the TV, which is not true, uh, you know. But I think in Independence, we're unique because we listen to each other. And I would like us, us to be the one to stop a lot of things. And it does, as much doesn't happen in Independence, I, I admit, but I'm not saying that it can't because I talk to people that like me, that they said, but black people do cause a lot of crime. So it's a lot of misinformation out, of, out there why and things happen. So. Ed, is there something out there like a piece of paper that you take to? You have to talk to Helen Hurley. You have to talk to this person. You have to. So you won't escalate into the person we will kill later. And it has a lot to do with poorness here in Independence. I believe that I used to be targeted when I first got here 30 years ago. But now I believe, uh, along with being targeted for other things, whether people admit it or not, if you are poor and you look like you're going to do something and you look... That's the new targeted uh, population too. It's like everybody's about to fall into this. Um, and I just want to be proactive. Ed. Can we? Can you have like three people that you know you have talk with the police when you get out, where three people come and talk about why they that you know? Can we do things that may not cost as much as we think to help people not give you a problem, so you won't give me a problem? You know where I'm going with this. Yeah, I, I guess one thing I would, I mean, from my seat, and I don't say this as a, a roadblock so much, but uh, I, I don't know what leverage we would have to get people to talk. You know, I, I, I don't know how we bring people to the table. I mean, I, yeah, we can present all kinds of stuff. We present stuff now. We we give them a uh, the first step, somebody on drugs, we try to give them off drugs. We give them first step card. We say, hey, call this number and get some help. Uh, you know, and to speak to your earlier party, what you're speaking of was, uh, you know, we've had officers that go to, you know, uh, Price Chopper or High V will have somebody in custody because they're stealing uh, a bunch of meat or something. And then they get there and they find out the mom trying to feed their kids and the officers will pay for the food and get it. Now that doesn't happen every day. I'm not going to say, but mm -hmm. I mean, there's times that, I mean, officers have paid because a lady was in domestic violence and she was trying to get shelter and she had two flat tires and he went and put tires on her car and, you know, so she would have tires. And so uh, there, there's, there's times, uh, you know, there's, I, I think there's plenty of times of mercy and there's, there's times of grace and, and, um, and goodwill that unfortunately those are never known about. And I'm, I'm not trying to bring them up here as if like we've, we like, we've got it all figured out. I just, I know that, I think what you're saying pie in the sky is that <clears throat> are there other avenues besides taking people to jail? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the one thing is if you're the victim, uh, we still are working for the victim too. I mean, they, they have rights and they want their day in court. They want either, rep, you know, some, some type of response to this person's held accountable. And, and although there may be times that it, it might be a, a a violation that you don't have a, a victim uh, where officers use discretion. But sometimes if a victim, if a victim says, I, I want to file charges, we're filing charges and we don't have, we have little, we're going to have a lot less sway in the terms of what the outcome is on that. 
and I believe in filing charges. I believe in victims because, you know, you're still a victim even if someone, you know, chokes you and kills you. So I believe in victims. But I'm saying after the fact, after they're charged or whatever, can't people be forced to do the right thing? Like, you have to talk to Helen Hurley. You have to talk to this. You know, I'm thinking, trying to think out of the box. I want change. I don't just want to keep blaming each other for doing something wrong. I kind of want change to happen before I die in independence. And, and, and quite honestly, that's all on the judicial side. We, I mean, uh, when we when we arrest somebody, we just take the information we have in a report and any evidence, and we mm. send it to the prosecutor and the judge. And they, we, we're pretty much done besides testifying in that. And then if there's going to be any follow up, um, for example, like for domestic violence or other crimes of uh, right. Of, of, of aggression or violence, they they send they'll send them to uh, anger management classes. Uh, it happens a lot with the youth too, through uh, youth court. Is um, but the courts really are the ones that are going to have to petition that to happen. Our ability to to have leverage, you know, you can make it part of part of their sentencing is you know the courts would have to say you need to go complete this class or you need to go talk to Helen, you need to go do this or that, and when you bring back the certificate then we're going to, we're not going to, you're not going to have to, you know, pay the fine or you're going to have to or get a felony on your record that you don't need. Cause then you are really going to be stealing and doing stuff, you know, or just, you know, you're hopeless, but that's where I'm getting at. I don't expect the police to do everything. I just want to, I want us all to think out of the box. Like the next time you see a judge, you know, some, some crazy lady that lives in independence said, can we, can we find a way that we can do this? I just want to think not just present problems as we do this process. And I know Meredith, Casey, and Helen, and everybody out here, Thad, definitely, Jennifer. I, I want to be more thoughtful about the future, not just, you know, putting Band-Aids. And I, I just want to be thoughtful in other areas, too. And I've thought about this for years, and I've asked people and say, well, we don't have enough money or so we need to talk to judicial people too in this process because yeah, you know we, I, I appreciate yeah. the police but if y'all yeah, get yeah. on my bad side you know but i appreciate you know <laughs> you, I, just, I care about you, you. you need to stay off that that tall skinny pedal on the right to stay on the left I, one. <laughs> but you know i just i expect a lot you know out of human beings that's all yeah well yeah no i appreciate your your desire to to be a part of change. And I, I agree. I just, um, you know, a lot of that, we don't have the leverage to get people where they, where they can best be receive the yeah. help that would probably be useful. Um, One um, quick comment um, um, yes. to this point and to Major Turner, your point, just a, a matter of, of saying, I think, I think we can't overstate um, what a great balance mix of people we have with this task force, with the history of work that's been done up to this point. Um, but I, and not even a caution, just I think we need to continue to embrace, as um, Nina said, that independence is uniquely different than even our counterparts um, to the West and, and other areas. And personally, having had an experience with a law enforcement agency this year involving my daughter with a detainment, um, and the experience being very different than what I know to be true with my leadership interactions and relationships out here, um, and looking for a, a level of diplomacy and transparency and communication, even just to respond to questions and wasn't getting it, um, I can see how there um, is a mixed bag, if you will, of experiences in trying to do this work with law enforcement. But I think what we have to remember as we go forward with our work is there is a, a great variety of people that are going to make this work. I, I call them the kind of like the outer circle trailblazers. They're going to be people, and I, and I hope I, I don't um, embarrass them, but I love Thad's energy and Helen's energy. Those folks that are going to hold feet to the fire, you know, request accountability, act for um, policy change, Casey included. Um, and then there are others who want to sit at the table and have conversation and let me give you my eyes and I'll take yours kind of thing. Um, and to Nina's point, you know, I think what happens is law enforcement right now finds themselves, um, we have just kind of unloaded everything. We need you to be the therapist, the connector, the referral person, and you need to have great judgment and do X, Y, Z. Um, we're creating, I think, a framework here in independence where we are starting to talk more and give eyes and history and understanding where we haven't had it in a long time. And that's the frame that we need to build on. I, 
I know that IPD has broad shoulders. They're taking all of this data, this information, the comparisons to other jurisdictions and other events. And I appreciate Chief Halsey and their leadership. They're not deflecting, they're, they're going through their policies, they're answering, um, they're responding. Um, and some of our data is not apples to apples to what's happening in Kansas City or in other places. So I just, I think Nina's point is good. I think we can, we can continue to get to change if we keep this dynamic where we're building those longer tables and having this collaborative discussion. Yes, we need to keep accountability. Yes, we need to have more transparency. But remember, we have not historically, recently at least, had the same level of encounters that we've had in some of our locations to the West and other places. And I just think we're building a new dynamic with um, law enforcement that you don't see in the region. And I would never want us to get too far away from that. So I'm, I'm off of my soapbox, but just having had a personal experience, um, not even 20 miles away, it is uniquely different um, so what Independence, I think, is doing here, especially the police department, um, is they have our attention um, and, and we have a microphone with them. I just want us to be equitable in how we offer to be a part of that change um, and making sure we're not asking just one entity to carry the, the sole load, if that makes sense. Well, and I, if I can borrow your soapbox for a moment, <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of these issues are dealt with with uh, the kids when they're young. Um, I'm mean, not saying that it's it's their fault I'm, that we got plenty of room for improvement, but um, building those relationships young with the youth. Um, it, 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 and Nina, to your point, this sometimes can be pie in the sky for us. I mean, I as much as I love doing that, but you you're chasing all the needs, all the homeless needs, all the mental health needs, and again, and these aren't excuses. Don't don't please don't take them that way, but uh, because when somebody needs something, they call the police and we're happy to do what we can. You know, you know I got four parking complaint issues on my phone when I came back. It, 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 those are part of what we do. We farm them out. We go do them and everybody wants, some of them are on private property, some of them are in the street. And we then we have to figure out how, who handles what uh, from the city. But so I guess the point is, I think so much of this happens in the youth and and you're talking, and I don't know if it's Nina, maybe you, somebody said about the misinformation going out is, I, I mean, I would also say the misinformation about law enforcement, you know, that's, that's out there that the police are going to kill you or police are going to hurt you. And how, what do I do if the police stop me? And I guess something that took me back and um, I don't know, Meredith, you were in that meeting, uh, but a couple of uh, a couple of ladies in one of our other groups had made mention that they were approached by some young kids that they work with and they, they the question was asked well i'm sh should i be scared of the police or should you know what what should i do and and they didn't know what to tell them and that that was concerning to me that they don't know what to say uh, because I, I i i understand the question i understand the but i also would like people to draw on their own personal experience uh, on what they know to be true, not what gets portrayed uh, by different outlets. And so that educational piece uh, by the police department, I think one of our best advocates in the police department are school resource officers uh, to be able to connect with kids at a younger age, uh, just let them know that we're just people and that you, know, you don't have to be scared of the police. Uh, you should be concerned if you're violating the law. I mean, there is, it should be some not scared, but just saying, Hey, yeah, there's an expectation here. But, um, and so I, I guess the, my whole point on that was just saying that we use those uh, avenues and I'm looking for input from this group and any group I sit with in the community on how we can unite uh, with the youth in ways that they don't have to feel threatened by the things they hear or, the, or even the things they see. Uh, again, and again, not saying that I'm not going to stand and say that police do it right all the time. And just like Meredith, your experience was that, you know, I struggle with this. A lot of times officers get so busy on the road, they forget that they're an ambassador for the police department. Every contact, um, I used to teach a, a, an ethics class so, so quite a few years ago, probably 12 or so years ago at the police department. And one of the things that came to me was, I, I can remember, and I've asked you this, do you remember the first time you were ever stopped by a police officer? 
I mean, I think most of you, if you've been stopped, you can say, you can recall, I remember most everything about that situation. Um, but for a police officer, it was just another stop. <laughs> I mean, quite on that, they do it all the time and they don't realize the impact they have on somebody's life that how that person is going to always remember that contact and how important that contact is for an officer. You're, you're kind of, you get, you get complacency in terms of what, what impact you have in the lives of the people. So anyway, sorry, I you can have your soapbox back. I didn't mean to get sidetracked, uh, but that's a great point. Uh, Meredith and I appreciate you bringing that up. I don't know if that stirred anybody's thoughts or anything you wanted to feed off of, but do you want me to keep going through these? Um, we're getting, we're getting halfway. Does that sound good? Um, to jump in real quick, Major Turner, um, since we are almost at the 12 o'clock uh, time spot, we can continue to keep going. Um, we may have to consider maybe breaking this up into two, two parts. I think we're having really good invoking conversation and dialogue, and I think it's important but um, we probably don't want to run over a three hour meeting. So just keeping those kind of timelines in mind, I think if we start coming up across the one o'clock mark, we might want to have some discussions. I have a few more things to provide to the group before we close for the day. But I mean, I think, like I said, once we start coming up against one o'clock, we might want to talk about maybe breaking this into two sessions. Okay, is that okay with everybody else? Or are you all good with that? Or does anybody need to take off? Um, I will have to likely leave it. Dad, you have to go. At noon, like at noon, 15, I should okay. be good. Um, well, I can try to hit a couple of these, and I don't know, Becky, if you have stuff that, that you need to get with that on, or do you want me to stop here, or just touch base on a couple more of these, and there, there's not as much dialogue on, uh, on most of the rest of them, but they're, well, they're from my end. You, you can go ahead with your presentation and anything that Thad misses. I'll, I'll regroup with you, Thad, um, for the things that I need to discuss with the group afterwards. Major Turner, before you go to the next point real quick, and I apologize if you covered it in earlier meetings that I missed. Um, as we're talking about um, kind of comparing incidents against some of these other municipalities and, and um, these bullets that you're working through, it would be so nice, at least for me, to see um, maybe even just in the last quarter in 2020, um, these incident reports or occurrences, whether it be by complaint or whether we have um, stops where anything other than a peaceful hold was made, like where can we actually see data to see the policies that you say IPD abides by? You can tell in our numbers, there's just been a shift since such and such took the helm. Or can we get raw data? Is that accessible to the public anywhere where we can just see for ourselves in terms of, of stops and detainments and, and those things that might get along the lines of um, um, civil rights issues or race relations issues or that kind of thing? So if I'm hearing you right, um, we, I mean, the Attorney General's office gets all of our numbers and they review all our numbers and we have to, then they, they request us to do a report on those numbers. If there's any variances in terms of uh, people that are stopped because there may be a higher race that stopped based on our, um, what, what the population is in the community. So uh, the attorney general's office has those numbers. I can give those numbers out to the same numbers that we, we send to the attorney general's office it comes back, uh, you know, either way and i don't know if that's really what you're looking for is when you're talking about stops and 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 uh, the ratio of um minorities or is that what you're kind of looking for are they broken up by demographically yes well yeah. I, yeah they are what's the format of that is that a pdf thing um, that? and yeah, how far I, does it go back i mean is that a monthly report how often is that generated it's, it's a yearly report it's a it's it's an annual. I'm sure it's large and massive, but just for my own awareness, if we're talking about um, being accountable and holding accountability going forward, I'd love to see that for 2019. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's really common. In fact, you may even be on our website. Um, I've talked to John Syme, our PIO, and 
I think he may have posted it. I don't know if not. I know I've I've sent it out to uh, community concerned citizens. I think we'd send it out. And Becky, if we sent that at all to you, or have we sent anything to this group? I don't remember. Uh, or have we sent uh, those? I know we sent policies out to. I can't remember if this group was involved in that, but I, I recall seeing the list of policies, and I thought we sent it out to this group, but we might just I'll resend it. Yeah, get it everybody, get in everybody's email freshly. If we haven't sent it out, maybe we can kind of just do another email push with some of the things that they're requesting in this group. That way, it's all in maybe one one combined email, so it's easily accessible by everyone in this group. Yeah, sure, that would be good. Um, well, I'll, uh, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Meredith. We'll work on getting that out. Um, so we also have uh, number five on my list here is the duty to intervene, and we kind of touched based on it, but we didn't get into it. Uh, and in all aspects of the training, we I know that the Independence Police Department, we stress the concept of uh, using effective when using effective force uh, when officers or when officers are using force that uh, we uh, we monitor to that and help uh, to um, focus our effort to to intervene whenever those situ situations arise so uh, an officer I can tell you from the day first day of training in the police academy uh, what what is what is trained and what is transpired and what is uh, what is uh, how this is handled is if you are present when when something inappropriate or against policy or against law is occurring uh, we, this is what we tell all police officers if you're there then you might as well be doing it yourself uh, because if you're that's just that's just the way um, again doesn't mean uh, you know when we look at the issue up in Minneapolis doesn't mean that the officers always respond that way, but that would be an issue that would be taken up on a on a case by case basis if you see something that is dealt with, um, you know. And I've I've had to deal with that, you know. When you, um, of course, um, you you deal with those as they come up, and where you you would you pull somebody in and you question, um, you know, when you watch a video, <clears throat> you know what what was seen and when was seen, and um, and how do you best respond to that? So. Um, I know there's, as far as a duty to intervene, I know I've seen uh, that's something that's an expectation that's taught from uh, first day of uh, uh, use of uh, response to force training in the police academy. Um, so I don't know, what have you all heard or seen or uh, what are your thoughts on the duty to intervene that would be uh, helpful for you to discuss? If you see anything, if you don't know right now, it's okay too. But um, if something that you come across, I'd be happy to take a look at it and um, see. I was going to look at. We we constantly um, review our policies and try to evaluate. I was thinking we, uh, and even since this, we we've gone back through again and and gone through and so the the policy I'll. I'll send you would be the latest one, but there's always a kind of, we have working copies that we, once we get them fine, uh, refined, then we, we upgrade and then we upgrade, uh, see upgrade when we, we alter anything and we send it back out to the entire police department and everybody has to sign off on it. And then it, then it's, uh, just, just to show that they've read it and signed off. They've read it. So, so, um, let me move down uh, to number six is the ban shooting at moving vehicles. Um, our our policy already addresses this, um, the shooting of vehicles. Basically, it says uh, discharging a firearm at or from a moving vehicle is authorized only when uh, any one, any person is in imminent danger of serious physical injury and all other reasonable means of defense have been exhausted or are not uh, available. And then number two would be any occupant of the suspect vehicle is using or threatening to use deadly force by means other than the vehicle, thus creating an imminent danger of serious physical injury. 
And so shooting at a moving vehicle is very dangerous and we recognize that. Um, I, I will tell you that things that we, we do have to take in consideration was from, you know, I've got uh, several cases here documented from 2006 through May of 2020 where uh, vehicles were intentionally used as weapons to run over people or run over officers or, and <clears throat> there are times that uh, instead of banning anybody ever being able to, to use lethal force at a car that's uh, being used as a weapon, uh, we feel it's, it's better to address an outline in our policy um, when, um, when that, use of force is appropriate versus saying uh, a sweeping policy that just prohibits action altogether. Uh, if somebody uses a weapon as a, as a, as a, a lethal force, then officers, you know, have to respond to that, uh, respond to that. And again, we, you know, we train officers to try to stay out of the way. And like I mentioned earlier, if I'm standing in the middle of the street and a car's coming at me and I don't have time distance or shielding to, to get away from that, I don't have, I don't have a lot of options uh, left in my tool belt, if you will, to to manage that situation. Again, those aren't frequent, but they have happened. Uh, so I don't know about shooting at moving vehicles. Anybody have any questions on that or things that have come up? Um, the, the, the seventh thing is um, require use of force continuum. We have our our response to force policy contains a type of a force re response uh, continuum. Uh, a lot of times, instead of hearing me saying use of force, uh, I'll say response to force, because generally what what that means is someone has already shown they've uh, taken a position of force, and we're responding to the force that's been presented. Uh, we're not out initiating force without uh, undue reasoning and um, so if I if you hear me use those words synonymously I mean we our verbiage is we response to force uh, it it's going to be synonymous with what you see in the public by saying a use of force um, so hopefully that had, but one of our guiding principles is a force continuum is really kind of a linear approach meaning it's kind of like this is the only way it works you have to go like this way when it, it, th those things are so fluid sometimes you might go from talking to somebody to to the highest level but um, our guiding principle is what the law says and the law references a, a 1989 case called uh, Graham versus Connor and it refers to objective reasonableness and that is our standard in all law enforcement that you'll find that's what the courts hold is what's allowed so objective reason, what's objectively reasonable uh, based on the situation uh, will be really the standard that that is uh, evaluated by the courts and is is used in our review process as well. And I don't know if you all are familiar with force continuums or that, that terminology much. Uh, Helen is, I don't know if anybody else is, but um, you can find a lot of different things that are available out there to probably speak on that. Did anybody have anything on the force continuum piece that, and these may be newer words for some people. So if you come across something and a question comes up after you find that, please let me know and we'll, uh, we'll work with that. So um, the, the number eight item is require comprehensive reporting. And I, I tried to cover this. I, I think I covered this pretty well on our very first bullet where I talked about, um, you know, supervisors or uh, supervisors notified uh, that ambulances will respond to based on the situation, uh, response to force report is completed, re pictures are taken, or, you know, any video is tagged, uh, in-car video, they have to tag their video and now it's saved so it doesn't disappear. <clears throat> There's many times that it happens off scene. You, you end up running behind a dark building or down an alley or in a, in a house and you don't, there's no video. It just isn't going to be available. And so we, we're not opposed to body cameras. Uh, in fact, if funding is there, we, we you know, we would, uh, we'd be willing to do that. In fact, most of the officers would like to have that because 
it would it would actually clean up a lot of situations. But um, if we were just, and I don't want to get into, uh, I don't want to get off the of comprehensive reporting, but going out and just buying cameras would be doable. Uh, we there is a lot of other factors that weigh into that, and it may be something we can have another time since we're short on time. But um, for us to pull that information based on a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request, and and make those available to anybody that asked for those. It, it's We figure we're going to need about three people to manage all the video that would be created because there is some redacting that would have to go in uh, possibly on some of that, which basically means we would have to manage what information is going out. We're not sending people's date of birth and social security numbers out uh, that are being read on the video. Um, and trying to protect, you know, in some degree, the identity of some. Um, and if obviously, if it's a closed case, none of that would be available anyways until the case was adjudicated in court. So um, I kind of skipped right into the, uh, the I know, I know um, Roman and I, have we've had discussion, Roman's talked about uh, body cameras for, for many years. And um, there's a lot of other parts to make that system work. Um, because once you go with body cameras going away from them isn't really a good option. So how do you, how do you build that in, you know, one-time funding, how do you build that in, in the next three to seven years, whatever the lifespan is of that to keep that system, to keep the system up and running with upgrades. And um, anyways, those are, again, those are hurdles. I'm not saying they're, they're, they're the things that are going to prevent us from moving forward are just things that we have to figure what we can work through to, to provide that. So as far, let me go back, as far as comprehensive reporting, what are the things that you know or have heard or you think of when you hear comprehensive reporting after I kind of give you a flyby on what, how we respond to that? Oh, we, um, let me mention first, we also, we do, uh, we do have, I told you that, that those reports, when they're done, going through all the chain of command to the chief, they go to the, to the um, internal affairs a captain and he files them in. A, so we have a database that tracks all that information um, that is that is um, is kept for review and patterns. So, anyway, so yeah, can I ask a question about comprehensive reporting real quick? So does that include any witness statements? And if the victim is alive, does that include their statements too? You know, where you got a cross reference of, of or is it just a police statement? Uh, so it, yeah, it, it's basically going to be all, all the information that we we took in. So when the a lot of times when the sergeant goes and takes a picture of the um, the suspect, um, you know, there's dialogue with the suspect in terms of uh, what. So a lot of times they won't even let us take their picture. Not a lot. There there are not a lot. That's not fair to say. There are sometimes we they won't even lift her shirt up so we can see where we tasered them and we're not going to go fight them just to get a picture of a taser mark in their back or in their, wherever. So, um, again, there is some dialogue, there's dialogue with, with, uh, between this first line supervisor and, uh, the suspect, but all those situations vary in how they, they unfold. And one I last one. You go. No, you go. Mine is about the, you talked a lot about body cameras, and I learned this year that um, all of the police officers have microphones, correct, on their body, and that the vehicles have cameras themselves. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, I just think that that is um, helpful that for citizens to know that the, even there are some new re, um, studies with body cameras and how effective they are, but that's not for this um, discussion. But um, it's good to know that all of the police officers do have microphones on them and that there are cameras. They're just in the vehicles, right? Correct. And um, okay. yeah, we'll, uh, we'll say like if an officer is working off duty, uh, it's likely they're not going to that 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 uh, microphone. Uh, call it a uh, that microphone's connected to a car that has a camera on it. 
So if they're working an off-duty job that doesn't have a car, there is no audio that captures that. Uh, if they get more than depends on depends on line of sight from the car, they a lot of times they the uses of force, the response to force happen because somebody's trying to flee or and then when they run behind the house, then you don't hear it. So uh, and on a, on a rare occasions, uh, it may not be synced up because there is a the system periodically wants to up, update or reconnect because it's all ran through internet. And if something messes with the signal, sometimes they'll get bumped, their micro will get bumped off of the car system. So now it, if they don't recognize that before the next incident happens, then there are times that we don't catch capture that. Of course, it, um, it just doesn't look good when you don't have that. It looks like, well, really, you don't really have that. And that's, that's convenient, you know, but it really, there are things that do come up that you just, it just happens and it, it, it loses sync or, um, so we address those if, in all of those situations in our, in our after action reports, like in mine, I have to put in there or one of the supervisors before me will say, I sent this to fleet maintenance because this is a problem and we need to troubleshoot this system because this, this system keeps getting bumped off. And so we may not, it may not result in any type of verbal warning or discipline to the officer. It may be a mechanical issue, but we document those and it goes in or after action on every pursuit and every use of force that, that goes that way. And so we, we do that. And those are just things that we try to manage to mitigate the, the mechanical issues. I was going to ask another question Ed, that is important to me. So Michael Brown, I'm from St. Louis. So that always bothers me, his case. And there were witnesses that says that, you know, he was being followed. He was, uh, things were being said to him that were incorrect socially. And then he was asked to come to the car. And then when he came to the car, he was kind of, you know, roughed up and pulled in. And it's a whole scenario. And there's so many witnesses that said that scenario. And then witnesses that says he was shot, you know, was saying, okay, forget it. And that makes sense if it's a young guy to say, okay, just don't shoot me. After all, no matter what went down. Why aren't the witnesses now, in independence, if that went down, and I hope it never does, if there are four witnesses to say this happened, and they all sound pretty much the same, and there's one policeman that says this, will you still take in the gravity of weighing the situation, the witnesses and the police, or is the policeman's word law? Or do you take in consent, you know, the whole thing, especially if he's had things in his background? And let me add that to, to the conversation. I just want to know. Well. I, I guess I don't know where to go with that, Nina, because I want to respond to the St. Louis shooting, and I don't know if you want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> uh, because it, 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 I do a little bit want to hear if it makes well, sense. And I would rather be in person to tell you my thoughts on it, but okay, just uh, tell me in person then. Okay. Tell me in person one. All right. Anyways, well, I, I we um, if some if there's a shooting there's multiple different, there's different people that look at that. So the prosecutor generally will show up on the scene. If we have a police shooting, particularly if it's life threatening, the prosecutor comes in. So we're going to have investigators from Missouri State Highway Patrol or somewhere else. If we're, say we, we go down into Kansas City, we have one right now where one of my officers is on leave because he was involved in a shooting in Kansas City. Well, Kansas City's investigating that. We're not investigating that. We were in I've, I've got two of my officers off on two different shootings. And so Highway Patrol is doing one, Kansas City is investigating the other. Uh, so those are separate eyes that see it. Uh, our internal affairs is going to look at it. The prosecutor's office is going to look at it from their own, their own investigation. And then if the person dies, the medical examiner comes in and they do a separate investigation. So I'm not saying that I, I, I realize the fact that if there's a piece of information that's not shared, then that's lost. I'm not saying that that, that couldn't be something, but there's a lot of hands in there trying to pull that same information to find out every nuance. So somewhere the, along those lines, somebody says, makes a statement to somebody that's in their record between all those different people touching it. So um, I think, um, I think by and large, there are some checks and balances nothing's perfect in in life um, but there are some things that might help people know that we're not just 
you know, taken off with everything that just as it looks on the surface. Yeah, that's good to know is checks and balances, because I'll always be concerned about, you know, no matter how thuggish a person supposedly is or whatever, you have to ask the question because it could be your child one day that could be thuggish. You know, I just don't have, I'm not privy to that. You have to ask the question, is that what should have happened, especially when they left his body out there four hours? That was a long time. And that's just suspect to me. But thank you. We'll talk about it one day because I know you know the inside story. And then I'm from St. Louis. I know some stuff, too. I look It'll forward work. to it. Good discussion. <laughs> yeah, I respect you. You know that, Ed. Love you and respect <laughs> you. No, I want you to be able to see what you what you think. Mm -hmm. um, so I went through all eight points, and I, I know we can probably drill into stuff more, and uh, happy to do that when the when the time's available, and we can, um, you know, I'm sure you all hear things or see things or see what other cities are doing. And the one thing I I try to avoid is um, taking a national movement and trying to plug that into a local situation. Meaning I'm not saying there aren't things that we can't glean from things that are happening around the nation or other larger cities or smaller cities. But I, I really, you know, we, we, we want to police the people as they want to be policed. And we have to trust that uh, we, um, you know, we work with, we don't try to take a round, round peg over here in this part of the country and, plug it into a square hole in our city, if that makes sense. Uh, so there's things we can take from every situation, but, um, and we can try to figure out what parts of it are beneficial moving forward. And these platforms are very helpful and necessary to do that. I appreciate your all's willingness and um, desire to, to be a part of that. What else says uh, that's those are the eight points I know um, and I can I've got here in my notes just so you all know and if you have other things I've got on here that uh, send out the uh, department policies online uh, send out the profiling stats for last year um, I think those are online or I know they're online already but I just for the ease of you having to not chase them down I can get those out to you uh, I think we have them on our website too but I again I get with John Simon, make sure that, and then, um, um, and then look at putting our policies uh, online so that uh, they're just available for all to see. Those are the, really the points I had in, re in reply. Is there anything I missed on that that you thought of? Nothing that I can think of. Um, I appreciate um, you, Major Turner, and your willingness to work with the citizens to come together and figure all this stuff out. Well, thank you. I, I, I definitely don't have it all figured out, but we're, I think we can figure it out together. I mean- uh, We're at the table together. That's the important you, thing. You bet. Yeah, you bet. And Major Turner, you know, I, I'm a real intelligent, thoughtful person. And, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I express my hands, you know, uh, but know that there is a movement but i do not um i do not judge my city on the movement but i will not discount the fact that the movement exists that i know people that have been hurt and killed that my parents never made enough uh, money as other people and had to march for it and i was born in 1961 so i have to encompass it all even if things are getting better here i have to be thoughtful enough to mention that it did exist and it's a lot of people here that are older than all of us or younger than all of us. And they feel totally different, no matter what I say. They wanna say all lives matter. My grandma was a preacher. I know that already, but I will say that I will always mention that black lives matter because they do. And because I'm affected by it. You know, whether someone living somewhere else, I just happen to be living on the greatest place on earth. But that doesn't mean that I don't care what happens to people all over the world. And so I'm a world thinking person, but I love this city. And I, I'm always very happy to be in the conversation and that you all, you know, we all talk about things because there is pain in growing. There are growing pains. And I, I think we get over our growing pains very respectfully, very caringly. So don't even get me wrong. I'm kind of like an activist and I'm kind of like kumbaya, you know, my 
we preachers kids, me and you, you know what I'm talking about. So I have to say it all. I, you know, if I didn't say it all, I would be remiss. You understand? Well, and I, and I, I mean, if we're being candid, I, I have reservation with the, the movement, capital letters, Black Lives Matter, uh, their movement. I, I agree that Black Lives Matter in, in every environment, every community, but I, 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 I have trouble with the movement Black Lives Matter because of uh, their foundation um, of things, but in the defunding and a lot of things. And I'm not saying that that, that pain isn't real and it's not being uh, presented as they know to present it. I'm, I'm just saying that um, it, it's in it's in stark conflict with uh, many things uh, that um, that I hold true and and as uh, we try to serve the community. So. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I don't mean any discredit on anybody, but I, you know, want to share where I, where I'm at too, in terms of that. I like, I always tell people, I like that. I want to hear Cause I know you can't be different than who you are, but you definitely have to be who you are. And I respect you and I know where you're coming from, but you got to understand where I'm coming from. Black lives do matter to me because I have four sons and I've lacked in a lot of ways because I'm black and African-American through jobs, even my husband or whatever. Age discrimination is a whole nother thing. Uh, you know, orientation is a whole nother thing. All of this is important to me. So I have to say, if you're African-American, you have to say black lives matter and no one to get that, but you, and, but I respect where you're coming from, but you got to know, no one can get that, but me. And, but we can still come together and negotiate and understand that we all love each other though. That's, that's our common ground. But we're always going to be different. You know, we like different foods. I like different things. So it's all right to be different. But, you know, respect and negotiation is very important in a marriage and in society. Yep. Major Turner, I think um, some of the notes that you have for the things that you um, said that you will look into and give to us and put on, hopefully put on the website and everything. Um, I think those are some of the recommendations that were made way back in March um, from the task force at the city council meeting. Um, but I can't remember all of them. So um, I think either all of us or I can look at it and re-email some of those other recommendations because you may be touching on all of them, but there might be some others that we're forgetting from since it's been months since we, mm -hmm. um, so anyways, just to, for us to remember that there might be some more that we were thinking um, or asking of the police force. Not sure. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, of course, the COVID and just being just disjointed, I guess, with everything going on. And if anything slipped through the crack on my end, please let me know. You're not going to hurt my feelings by reminding me or asking me where something's at. So I would be the first time. It probably won't be the last time, but but I'm happy to try to fill those voids and build bridges so we can uh, keep that communication alive. Thank you for everything and being so transparent. Sure, happy to happy to be a part of the group and looking forward to still working for working for the. Hi, that's your kitty cat. That's nice. <laughs> Uh, that's cute. Yes, I, I echo that too, Major Turner. I appreciate appreciate your everything you said today, and I think it's very very important that the community has that information and that open dialogue with the police department to keep that understanding and to be able to support the department and the department have um, that understanding with the community so that it does work together and not against each other. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, out of all the groups I work with, I think this one, we're probably starting to lose a lot of people here, but it would probably recognize that um, when, whenever, like right now, officers, you know, we had such a roller coaster ride. You went from having COVID and being essential workers and people putting putting signs in the front of the police building. We support you bringing stuff, dropping stuff off the next, and within a week, people are basically throwing stuff at you, not not always literally, but, and so that roller coaster ride of that response. And so now, I, from my perspective, you get 
the sensation on the law enforcement side that you start to get defensive because uh, some of these conversations are harder because uh, because of the outright attacks and a national and and a natural approach into a local in community. So that's why I think sometimes the local um, the local perspective is is important to to make sure that we're scope our scope is on that uh, and not the emotional strain that gets gets brought up by uh, the national frenzy. Uh, and so that we can come to the table in a non-threat, less threatening manner. Um, but again, that those, it, it goes on both sides. I'm not saying that, you know, that's just one-sided, but. Did anybody ever else have any questions regarding item number two on the agenda? All right. Great. So um, like I said, and thanks thanks again, Major Turner, I think you did a really awesome job with that presentation. It was very informative, and I'm glad that we as a group were able to have that, that dialogue. I think this is important not only for this group, but I'm glad that obviously this is live stream. So anyone else who would like to kind of see what you guys discussed today, that that's going to be online for people to kind of review so they know what some of your guys' procedures are what some of your procedures are and what we're kind of trying to do and accomplish moving forward. So I'm quite grateful for that. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to kind of discuss with you guys, last night we got a request from one of our council members regarding a resolution of support for the police department. And essentially um, what this council member would like us to do as a committee is to review this resolution and make recommendations so he can present it to the council and get council approval on it. But the language in the resolution, he would like this group to look through to make sure that, you know, it it expresses what he wants, but also expresses what, you know, the community would like to see in this type of support for the police department to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page as far as this goes. So I will get an email out to you guys later this afternoon with that resolution. I just want you to keep in mind that that's what we're looking for is just to take a look at that, provide feedback. So we are going to wind up meeting again before that gets put on an agenda. Um, and with that being said, I think our target date for that would be the September 7th agenda. So I'm thinking that we'll probably wanna meet that first week of September. So you guys can provide your feedback on that resolution. Um, I'll send out another email to get schedules all lined up so we can have that meeting in September and give you guys enough time individually to look over the resolution, to compile your feedback, and then we can meet again first week of September. Um, with that being said, was there anything else that anybody needed to discuss before we adjourn the meeting? No, thanks, Major Turner, for, for the information that really helped provide some insight. Thanks, everybody else, for attending. Yeah, thanks so much, guys, for attending. So we'll go ahead and we'll adjourn the meeting. And like I said, just keep an eye on your email and we will get the next meeting, the next meeting scheduled. And any information that you need from me, you guys have my contact information. So just reach out if you need anything. Thank you. Right, we'll do. Take care. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you.